In 1978, 29-year-old Silas Warner became the first employee of Muse Software, founded by Supertext creator Ed Zarin. Silas developed the word processor App Pilot, as well as a pseudo-multiplayer demolition derby called Robot War, born from the Plato system. He also created an early Apple II sound engine called The Voice that enabled primitive recording and playback. One of the first games to use the tech surfaced months later. Castle Wolfenstein was released for the Apple II DOS Atari 800 and Commodore 64 in 1981. It's considered one of the first laid plans of stealth action, sneaking past enemy lines six years before Kojima's Metal Gear. Players commanded an unnamed protagonist as he escaped a Nazi stronghold full of 60 randomly sorted rooms lined with locked treasure chests. Guards could be snuck by in silence or with a stolen uniform, killed, or even frisked for items. Silas Warner's voice software let the troopers emit garbled shouts in German, years before the technology was commonplace in games. This breakthrough in audio immersion made Wolfenstein a unique PC experience and prompted a sequel produced in 1984. Beyond Castle Wolfenstein engaged a more direct plot against the Third Reich by tasking the soldier protagonist with the assassination of Adolf Hitler himself in a mission very similar to Operation Valkyrie, also known as the July 20 plot. Guard AI was upgraded, requiring passes to infiltrate separate rooms, a knife could now dispatch officers more discreetly, and the sound effect library got a slew of new German expletives and commands. Muse published a few other games the same year and closed down in 1987. Silas Warner moved on to Microprose, which turned out PC games like Stunt Car Racer and arcade stand-ups like Xenophobe. Around this time, budding programmer John Carmack was attending the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He lasted two semesters and dropped out to make video games. After a brief stint with Night Owl Productions, Softdisk hired him to work on both Apple II and IBM related software, such as GS and Gamer's Edge. Carmack quickly showed a knack for reinventing game technology from the ground up. This eventually got him in legal trouble with fellow designer John Romero, so he was forced to establish a separate company called id Software. His first advancement with id, adaptive tile refresh, led to 1990's Commander Keen. He followed this with three-dimensional ray casting, which opened up the doors for Hover Tank and Catacomb 3D to finally free up first-person combat a year later. Seeking a more mainstream PC market, id turned its aim towards the Wolfenstein franchise that had been slumbering in a vault for five years. What they had in mind would embrace the original's Nazi revenge aesthetic far more than its stealth espionage. A whole new band of PC gamers would blast through it with little to no knowledge of the two title series it was based on. The first shareware episode of Wolfenstein 3D was released for the DOS operating system on May 5th, 1992. <laughs> Wolf 3D contained 10 missions per episode, each with the same objective. Find the exit. Three episodes were released in both the original commercial package and an additional add-on called the Nocturnal Missions, for a total of 60 levels. The first, three-part set followed the escape of William B.J. Blaskowitz from a Nazi stronghold, and the second played as a prequel with the same hero permanently halting production in a chemical warfare plant. Id originally wanted the remake to keep some of the stealth elements that made its predecessor popular, but early development revealed that allowing the player to hide bodies and steal uniforms slowed down the gameplay and complicated the controls. The game instead became a bullet-blasting marathon, a combat knife, pistol, machine gun, and chain gun were the only espionage tools needed to bring down Hitler's elite. Enemies dropped ammo upon death, med kits and turkey dinners restored health, and keys opened each final door. Beyond. The buildings weren't based on any real structures from World War II. Each set of ten missions had one that could only be accessed by finding a secret entrance. One of these was a throwback to Pac-Man. The episodes climaxed with an exclusive boss battle against officers like Hans Gross, Dr. Shavs, Otto Giftmacher, Gretel Gross, General Fechtgesicht, and the unmistakable cybernetic Adolf Hitler. Nein! 
Wolfenstein 3D became an instant PC classic, one that given its subject matter was shrouded in controversy. Its rocky release in Germany would haunt the series forever. It was eventually ported to the Apple II, Atari Jaguar, Panasonic 3DO, Super NES, Game Boy Advance, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and iPhone. Some updates doubled the pixel size of the enemies. The Super Nintendo received the most infamous changes in content, with blood removed, as well as Hitler as an end boss. Hungry for more levels, it managed to deliver a prequel slash sequel five months after the original. Subtitled Spear of Destiny, it documented an earlier campaign by Blaskowitz to retrieve the mythical lance that was used to pierce Jesus during his crucifixion. All of Destiny's 21 levels arrived in a single episode, and you only had to complete 18 of them to finish the game. The boss list featured another gross sibling named Trons, along with Barnacle Wilhelm, the Uber Mutant, the Death Knight, and finally, the Angel of Death. Two additional levels were created by FormGen, one of the game's publishers, a year later. 3D Realms also released the Wolf Creator that generated random maps, or allowed users to create new ones. The boys at id kept themselves busy during the rest of the century. Their 3D tech eventually opened the gateway to Doom, Doom 2, Quake, Quake 2, and Quake 3 Arena. They transformed ray-traced corridors into fully rendered environments, allowing for bigger weapons and bosses. Fostering their brand new custom franchises, they let the one they borrowed from Muse Software slip back underground, awaiting the new century. Grey Matter Studios, which had assisted with additional content for Quake and Call of Duty games, joined forces with ex-id employee Brandon James and his group Nerve Software to hunt down Nazi extremists once again. Building off the Team Arena engine, Grey Matter tackled the single-player campaign of this new venture, and Nerve handled the multiplayer. Return to Castle Wolfenstein was released for the PC on November 19th, 2001. In the prologue, players were reacquainted with German public enemy number one, William Blaskowitz, as he chased after Helga von Bülow back to the famed Mountain Fortress. After escaping and joining a group of resistance fighters, BJ encountered senior colonel Wilhelm Strasse, also known as Death's Head, director of the SS Special Projects Division. His ghoulish experiment spawned the Ubersoldaten, Death Knights, and the reincarnated Heinrich I of the Ottonian dynasty. The seven missions also involved other fictional SS officials like Major Hochstetter, General von Strauss, Colonel Strock, General Burkhalter, General Hauptmann, and General von Scherber, as well as the only non-fictional character in the game, Heinrich Himmler, the real-life head of the SS. While these missions far exceeded the tech that put the original Wolf 3D together, it was really the multiplayer that made Return memorable. Competitive options included Wolf MP, which focused on completing objectives, Wolf SW, or Stopwatch, where one opposing team set a time goal for the other to break, and Wolf CP, or Checkpoint, that simplified the map into several points to capture. The multiplayer frenzy forced players to focus on one of four specific classes at a time, when varied roles were not common among shooters. Soldiers were versatile marksmen, engineers repaired weapons and detonated charges, medics healed their comrades, and lieutenants called in airstrikes. Back in 1995, the source code for the original 3D Wolfenstein was released, so aspiring developers could make their own mesh of hallways, weapons, and legions of enemies. But none of the fan-created monsters that this early engine would spawn could compare to a byproduct of the series' return in 2001 called Enemy Territory. Its developer, Splash Damage, had worked with id before on a third-party map for Return to Castle Wolfenstein based on Operation Market Garden, which generated so much buzz it led to more work for the title's Game of the Year edition. As the team garnered even more success, plans were made for an official, separate release. Originally planned as an expansion, Enemy Territory was eventually distributed for free as a multiplayer-only add-on once progress on the single-player campaign fell through. Modes from Return's multiplayer came back with new classes called Field Ops and Covert Ops, along with the chance to gain experience for added weapons and abilities. 
Given its massive following, polished gameplay, and incredible value, it received over 25 Editor's Choice Awards and several nods for PC Game of the Year. The source code was given out in 2004, and since then, mods like True Combat Elite and ET Fortress have helped keep the territory alive and well with Ballistic Conflict. In 2008, EA capitalized on Wolfenstein's growing popularity with a mobile RPG. Although bearing visuals that harkened back to its ray-traced roots, it actually played closer to another one of id's recent recreations, Orcs and Elves. Revisiting the classic bits of the franchise was no doubt inspired by the upcoming PC, PlayStation 3, and Xbox 360 id software epic, simply called Wolfenstein. As the third official entry in the series, it picks up right where Return to Castle Wolfenstein left off, and is being co-developed with Raven Software. Endron Studios will give life to the game's anticipated multiplayer component. Despite his sacrifice and service to his country, it's obvious the work of BJ Blazkowicz is never done. Wolfenstein franchise will likely lose popularity when it stops becoming fun to kill Nazis, but we don't see that happening anytime soon. Just like Indiana Jones, Blaskowitz makes his stand on the line between the undiscovered world of the paranormal and one of the deadliest human threats the world has ever faced. This mix of true-life tragedy and sci-fi necromancy has its sadistic charm, and it's been fully realized thanks to the genius of John Carmack and the numerous inventive minds at it. Auf Wiedersehen.